Good afternoon. It is really nice to see you. And it's a privilege to talk to you about neighbors and reaching our neighbors for Christ. In the Bible, neighbors are very important. In fact, if you study the Bible, you'll find that it is a theme um, throughout the Bible. For example, in Proverbs 27:10, better is a neighbor nearby than a brother that is far away. And of course, we know the kind of neighbor we're to be. Jesus is that friend that sticketh closer. He's nearer. He's that neighbor, um, nearer than a, a brother. You're I'm going to sit down so that no, uh, you're blocking that. And I can see that I've been in the way. Can you see now? Yeah. OK. The Bible also tells us the secret to being good neighbors, and that's to love them. And the, the Bible-following Christian is a wonderful neighbor. The neighbors of Ellen White always remembered her after she died. She was that little old lady that always talked so lovingly about Jesus. She was a good neighbor. Uh, she sent around her nurse to the to the sick people in Australia that had no money or insurance. And her nurse took care of their physical ills and the way was opened for them to be open to the gospel. She was a good neighbor. I would like Jesus to be my neighbor. In fact, I want him to be uh, living in my house. Uh, this is the kind of neighbor that my parents always strove to be. Now, my, my father uh, was a pastor, and my parents were just godly people. And before we would move from one church, then go to another, we would get down as a family and pray that the Lord would give us non-Adventist neighbors so we could reach them and uh, befriend them. And, and we won neighbors. And I learned some very interesting and important points. Health is one of the most important routes in reaching neighbors. I learned much about treating simple, common ailments from my parents long before I went to medical school. And I learned more about practical nutrition from my parents before I went to medical school and how they approached and how you taught it by watching them teach the neighbors. I discovered that home is a great place to learn about lots of different simple medical problems. And I discovered from watching them that helping neighbors with their physical ailments is a wonderful way to win souls, to love them. In answer to the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus told a story of what a neighbor is. And he told the story of the Good Samaritan. And to show what a good neighbor should be, Jesus used the example of a Good Samaritan helping a neighbor who had lost his health. A good neighbor from Jesus' description is someone who helps their neighbor with a health problem. In volume six of the Testimonies, page 276, every church member should feel it his special duty to labor for those living in his neighborhood. Study, she continues, how you can best help those who take no interest in religious things. I learned a very important lesson about this this last spring. We live in a uh, uh, a, a sort of secluded area about 45 minutes from Dalton, 24 miles, and you can't see neighbors. It's a very wooded area, but there are seven homes that comprise what used to be uh, this, uh, this homestead. And so we have one of the little lots. One of the homes, the only home you can actually see as you drive up the road, 
is an eyesore. It's a terrible home, and it was actually built because the person who owned all the property was unhappy with the other neighbors, and so he decided he was moving, and he put this eyesore there and uh, sold it to somebody else just to make the other, man, the other neighbors unhappy. And um, people had moved out. It was now for sale. Dilapidated, leaky roof. The roof sunk in like, like uh, uh, you. And I was so delighted when the people that had been in it moved out because I thought, now we can get rid of this eyesore, which lowers the value of all of our homes. So I call up the, bo the zoning board to have it condemned. And the zoning board did not condemn it. They didn't even come out to see it. Well, one of the neighbors is an attorney. So he went down to the zoning board, and so the zoning board came back with this attorney and then said, well, it's not bad enough to condemn. And so if we would see somebody driving up to possibly buy it, we would actively encourage them not to buy it. We wanted this building, this house, this eyesore to, to just disintegrate to finally even the zoning board would say, yeah, it's got to be uh, pulled down. But the house we saw no potential in was viewed differently by another who saw it as a bargain. And he purchased it. Now we know, we knew this person this house had been purchased for two reasons. The first thing is the for sale sign came off, and the second thing is a sign went up, no trespassing. And the owner who purchased it immediately repaired the roof. He, um, um, is, uh, he cleaned up everything, took out all the junk, um, painted the doors. Um, he's planning on putting some bricks on the outside and he'll put on a, a real roof um, as he has the funds. And when he finishes, this house will be a lovely little home. And I suddenly realized how God saw my neighbors. See, it says study how you can best help those who take what? No interest in religious things. These are the ones we write off, call the zoning board, uh, you know, condemn this house. But Jesus' zoning board will not condemn even the neighbors who show no interest in spiritual things around us because he wants us to get bargains. And when he gets our neighbors, the first thing he'll do is the for sale sign is off and the no trespassing sign goes up. It's his property. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful we learned it from our neighbors who saw potential where we saw none at all. Now, how can I reach these people? It says by studying how best to help them. When we find a way to help our neighbors with their physical needs, these that show no interest even in their spiritual often change. As you visit, it goes on to say, as you visit your friends and neighbors, show an interest in their temporal welfare. See, that's being a good Samaritan. The good Samaritan didn't come and have a Bible study on the Sabbath. He had a care for that sick person. And if we take an interest in our neighbors and how well they're doing physically, financially, and socially, that's what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. We are interested in our own physical, financial, and social welfare, our temporal welfare. And as we manifest an interest in our neighbor's temporal welfare by helping them in every way we can, this is how we minister to our neighbor's temporal needs. Now, I told you we live in a neighborhood with seven neighbors. It's a, a non-paved road. 
And we have to keep up this road. It's nine-tenths of a mile. We actually live at the very end of it. And it's an expense to keep this up because the county won't take it on. Um, but we are glad because in this busy age, taking care of the road gives us a common reason to call our neighbors. Call our neighbors. We can talk to them. We organize the neighbors. We collect the funds uh, to get to the gravel. And as we talk to them, we begin to study. We begin to discover needs that they have. And I've been able to treat skin problems of our neighbors. Uh, we've been able to talk to them about dietary changes. And they've learned to trust us, as we've been there for the last five years. And we've been able to connect in simple things. We've had all of them over to our house. They've come for the meetings on the road. Our neighbors know our habits. They see me exercising every day. They see me walking with my wife. They see me running. And they know that we go to church every Sabbath. Not because we've ever talked to them, but they know it. They know it. But they think of us as good neighbors. And the person who lived in our house before, they hated. And they tell us every time we say, oh, we're so glad that you got that house. Um, we're so glad that the last neighbor is gone. Uh, a few weeks ago, my wife was calling our closest neighbor about some information about the road and what we had just learned about its maintenance. And after the brief report, my wife asked just a simple question. Is everything going okay? We hardly have seen you in the last month. There was silence. And our, our neighbor said, no, I need to talk to you. And my wife set up an appointment for her to come over. Um, she and her husband, had been going through a incredible crisis. And uh, so they came over and we had a chance to talk to them, to pray, pray with them about um, a terrible experience they had just experienced and to help them in any way we possibly could. And they cried with us as we prayed with them. Notice the part of the quotation that I skipped. As you visit your friends and neighbors, show an interest, what's the word? In their spiritual as well as in their temporal welfare. See, many show no interest in either their temporal or their spiritual welfare. Others show only interest in their spiritual welfare. If you show only an interest in your, parent, in your neighbor's spiritual welfare, only want to talk about the Sabbath, only want to talk about the state of the dead, they'll think you're not interested in them, you're only interested in making them a member of your church. But when we find a way to minister to their physical needs, we find ways to minister to their spiritual needs. Now, how do we minister to felt spiritual needs? It says, present Christ as a sin-pardoning Savior. There's only one way to minister to physical needs, and that's to know the right treatment. And there's only one way to minister to spiritual needs, and that's to know the right treatment. For physical needs, they're varied. But for spiritual needs, it's always the same. Present Christ. He's the solution to every spiritual need. So you have the answer that they need, but may not know they need, or may not know that you can help them with that need until you meet their physical need. How do you know that they are ready for a spiritual needs being met? Here's how you can know, with absolute certainty. Until a person asks you a question, they're not ready to listen to you. Because unless you ask a question, when you ask a question, you're asking somebody that you are accepting by the question as an authority. 
And Peter said, be ready to answer. Live your life in such a way that it will raise the question. And then be ready to answer. Present Christ as the sin-pardoning Savior. And then it says, invite your neighbors to your home and read with them from the precious Bible and from books that explains its truth. In my office, I just started my uh, dermatology practice last Tuesday. And we have a voluntary worship at 8 a.m. And I'm reading through the book Ministry of Healing with my staff who choose to come. I'm only reading a paragraph or two and then we pray. It takes less than five minutes. But my staff love it. They love the book. Again and again, they've been saying, I needed that this morning. And I pray for them, for their family, uh, for uh, our patients, and that God will give me wisdom as I see each patient. And um, the last day, let's see, today is, uh, that was Tuesday, and then we had to to uh, uh, drive to, to Florida, um, my nurse came up to me and she says, I want you to know how God answered your prayer for wisdom for the patients. Every single biopsy came back exactly what you uh, were ruling out, what you were thinking it might be. Now, um, that won't always happen, but what had she done? she had been listening to the prayer. Now, my nurse's husband is a pastor, and he's not an Adventist pastor. My nurse loves ministry of healing. Will she have an influence on her pastor husband? Oh, yes. Um, there's a lot of depth in this one sentence. Invite your neighbors to your home and read now let me uh, see if I'm reading this right. And read at them from the precious Bible. Read to them from the precious Bible. Read what? With them from the precious Bible. Notice it's something you do together. You enjoy the Bible with your neighbors, with your neighbors. Invite your neighbors to your home. It's virtually impossible to do this easily in their home. You can control the, the noise in your home. You can control things. Um, when they come to your home, they're expressing confidence and trust in you. They're giving you permission to lead out in the conversation at your home, and they're your guest. Invite your neighbors to your home and read with them from the precious Bible and from books that explain its truths. Today, we might add, uh, invite them to your home, show them videos. Uh, Doug Batchelor, Mark Finley, uh, Sean Boonstra, Kenneth Cox. We've done all that for our neighbors. And uh, many of you have uh, uh, done that as well. This, she says, united with simple songs and fervent prayers will touch their hearts. And then it says, let church members, what are the next two words? Educate themselves to do this work. Educate themselves. This is where you're going to have to be self-educated. Um, now, how do we begin? How can we be effective in our ministry? The first neighbor that we, are, we need to focus on is the closest neighbor, our bed neighbor and our bedroom neighbors with our children. Adventist Home 37, the first work of Christians is to be united in the family. Without being in the, uh, united in the family, we'll never be able to do effective outreach to our neighbors. And I've had a deepening conviction on the importance of being united. Notice what the next um, sentence is, then the work is to be extended to their neighbors nigh and afar off. After unity in the family, then the work extends uh, beyond to our neighbors nigh and afar off. 
Our neighbor is not limited to the person living next door, but the person who by providence is brought next to me. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chung, in a moment, is uh, going to explain some of those, but uh, afar off. But first, we want to look at those nine. And uh, uh, I want to tell you one story, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chung uh, to tell a story that just happened that you won't believe uh, unbelievable in America in 2010. Uh, but this is back to the winter of 1957. I want you to meet a poor family. They were trying to keep warm around a wood-burning stove. This was in Nashville, Tennessee. And unfortunately, the pipe in the upstairs became overheated and a fire started. By the time the mother smelled smoke, she looked up and saw flames along the ceiling. That mother, Julie Holmes, rushed four of her children out of the fire and then ran for the baby in the crib. As she picked the baby up and ran to the door, the ceiling with its burning embers collapsed on her. She attempted to protect the baby with her body, but both were covered with burns and her baby died. She was taken to the Madison Sanitarium and Hospital where the physician with the entire staff began to take care of her. She hovered between life and death. She had never gone to church, knew nothing about the Bible, but she understood love. And she became our neighbor. I have an indelible memory seeing her in the hospital, bandaged from head to toe. I was seven years old. Our family met her while we went around and sang for the patients. My dad was the pastor of the church. Julie was covered with bandages. She had only two places on her skin that were not burned, her chin and her, the vertex of her scalp. And she wanted her husband, Bill, to meet us. We set a time to see him that Sunday. We never did meet him. He drowned Saturday night when he became confused on an unfamiliar road in which it ran into the Cumberland River and he drowned. His last words were, where is the road? The physician asked my dad to go in and tell her the further news and what had happened to her life. And my dad had to put a a, take a hot water bottle on his stomach before he could go in and talk to her with the physician. It was an additional shock and they feared she would not survive it. Forty uh, nurses uh, donated their skin for grafts to save her life. The staff took her children. Prayer alone saved her life. But 40 years later she wrote the following letter. Uh, let me share this letter my folks received for their 50th wedding anniversary, June 6, 1996. Dear Pastor Mills and family, it doesn't seem that long, but it was the year 1957 when we first met. I'm so thankful we did, or I don't think I could have made it through that terrible year with all the pain and tragedy. But with you and your family telling me of Jesus' love daily and by being living reflections of him meant so much to me. I'll never forget Linda Jo, that was my sister, Philip singing for me and Linda reading to me. One song was Jesus, a wonderful friend. Well, it was Jesus, friend of the children, but that's how she remembered. I remember the Bible study you gave me with the slides and being anointed. I learned of Jesus' love. You used to tell me the story of Job and how he kept his faith in God through all his troubles. It made my troubles seem small compared to his, and that helped me a lot. Your daily visits, Mrs. Mills, I truly looked forward to. I remember one day I awoke and found a note saying I was asleep and you wouldn't awaken me. And you had left your flower from a wedding you had come from. Thanks again to Pastor Mills for taking care of the funeral services for my husband and bringing me a tape to listen to. I'm so grateful for you all finding Christian homes for my children there on the campus. Three of them, nurses and one office worker there at the hospital, they let me eat, know each day how the children were and brought them to see me nearly every day. I had some good loving care there at the hospital, a lot of prayers from the doctors and nurses that taught me a lot about Jesus. After all the love and care I received there from you and everyone I received Bible studies and was baptized by Pastor Mills, 
It wasn't easy when I left the hospital and was on my own, but you were always there to help me when I needed you and show me how to live a Christian life. I remember all the nice times we had together, in gathering down in Nashville, going to camp meeting and having our tents side by side and spending the night at your house one night and Sabbath dinner there. There were bad days too when you would help me clean up my house and do my laundry. I forgot to mention about the skin grafting temporarily that I needed. We had four family members, two friends, and that wasn't enough, so two nurses that were on duty that day volunteered. That helped me to recover. Some of the grafting took, and that's unusual. But with the Lord's help and my good doctors and nurses and you and your family and my dear family and all of our prayers I recovered, I have a beautiful family and I thank the Lord for them. My faith is still strong in Jesus. That is what a love, a united family and caring for the health needs of our neighbors can do, folk. Now we need to widen our vision of our neighbor. It includes the person next door, but includes the person next to me. It begins with my home, and then it goes on. Um, Dr. Chung, share with us what our neighbor is and your recent experience. I'd just like to read something from Desire of Ages. It says, is on the chapter, The Good Samaritan. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Is everyone property of God? We've been having Bible studies every Wednesday night at our, Bible, at our home. It's going on about 16 years now. And over the last uh, year or so, there's a pharmacist who came to our Bible study. His name is Tracy Daly. And he's a, he worked from Monday to Saturday. And as he learned more and more the truth, he got more and more convicted about the Sabbath. But, you know, he, it was very important that he kept his kept the Sabbath, uh, his um, store open on Saturdays. Because he says, you know, I'm, at least I'm helping people with medicine. But I said, Tracy, you know, um, you can help people in other ways. But God says we need to keep the Sabbath. But he was not really into that. Anyway, one day, he called me. He said, I have a customer that I really, really care about. They've been coming to my uh, pharmacy for years, and he is dying from lung cancer. He's about 60 years old. He has been suffering from lung cancer for several years. For the last two years, he has gone through chemotherapy and radiation, and this cancer was pretty much all over his body, and uh, he was dying. They, they said for him to go, go home, and he has about two to three months to live. And his name is John Beavers. I hope I'm not violating any HIPAA. <laughs> but um, Tracy said, would you, would you mind coming and praying for him? I said, okay. The problem was, it was Friday night, and on Sabbath morning, I had to go to Knoxville to speak. From our house to Knoxville, it's about two hours, two and a half hours. I go, you know, I need to prepare, and, but I felt, you know, I really need to go talk to this person. So Tracy, the pharmacist, and I went to this person's home. 
When I went to his home, this person was on 100% oxygen. He could barely talk. He had a very hard time breathing. And he could not go from his chair that he was sitting to the other side of the living room without a cane, nor you know, without assistance. And he was breathing like that. So, you know, I've been involved in many prayer services for the sick and even anointing services. And it was uh, discouraging for me because I haven't had any, I, haven't, I hadn't seen any miracles happen. <laughs> In fact, almost every single person that we prayed for and anointed died. And so when I went to this person's home, and when I saw his condition, I said, there's no way he's going to, he, no, he has no hope. But we started with a prayer and started giving him Bible studies. I asked him, what do you like to eat? He's a Baptist. He and his wife, he had 50 children and grandchildren. They just love him to death. Very, very nice man. And I fell in love with this man right away. And he had very strong faith. So I said, what do you like to eat? My favorite food is pork. And I love ice cream. I have to have ice cream every day. And he likes lots of sweets. And so I said, Mr. Beavers, let's talk about your diet. And uh, with prayer and diet, maybe God can work something out. And so I gave him the diet of Eden. What was that? What did God allow to eat? Fruits, nuts, and grains, right? No vegetables. After the fall, vegetable was added. Do you know why? Do you know why vegetable was added? I thought about that. And I studied into it, and I realized one thing, is that a lot of the medications that we use is from vegetables. Vegetables have healing properties. But in, in Garden of Eden, there's no disease. You don't need vegetables. So God knew in his infinite wisdom that we needed vegetables. So I said, that's the diet given after the fall. And I said, when was meat added? Uh, I don't know. I said, well, after the flood. Because there's no vegetation. And, and I said, how many animals did he you know, have him go into the ark? He said, two by two. But if you think about it, it's clean animals is by what? Seven by seven. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was always two by two. Well, if you know, if you study it. Any, anyway, if you notice, one of the reasons why God allowed meat is so he can shorten a person's life. Right? So I said, here you're dying with cancer. And we need to you're eating something that will even shorten your life even more. So why don't we stop, first of all, your pork. And then sugar is not really good for your immune system. So why don't we stop that? So I started giving him all this uh, diet, and we started praying and reading from the scriptures. And, and I was there from 8 o'clock to I came home at 5 in the morning. I was so tired. I slept about two hours that night. But um, actually that morning. But it was, I thought it was very good. But I thought that was the last time I will see this man. Three weeks later, 
Tracy Daly, the pharmacist, came to the Bible study and said, you are not going to believe this. Believe what? Mr. Beavers just went to the doctor. He has no cancer. None. And, and doctors cannot believe he, he doesn't have any cancer. And he said, do you know what he's doing right now? What is he doing? He's mowing his lawn. <laughs> and he asked him, he asked the doctor, Mr. Beavers asked the doctor, do you think this cancer will come back? You know, I, I don't know what happened to you, but I don't think you're going to die from cancer. You're going to die from something different. And then Tracy Daly, who I've been working with, praying with for, for some time, he said, I made a decision today to keep the Sabbath. Amen. I'm going to close on the Sabbath and open on Sundays. So through these, um, you know, actually it was, I had absolutely no faith in this person being healed. But it was probably the faith of this man, Mr. Beavers, and also probably Tracy, and the righteous one, the one who prays for us, Jesus Christ, who is the one who gave him complete healing. Let me just ask a, a quick question from you, Dr. Chung. Oftentimes we've heard that the reason why there's no miracles here in the United States is uh, because over in third world countries they're not very sophisticated and so um, they get uh, excited about miracles. They believe in, uh, in miracles. But here in the United States we're sophisticated so that miracles don't impact uh, us. Um, did that miracle um, impact sophisticated United States like a miracle in unsophisticated third world countries? Absolutely. We're actually, the United States is a spiritually a third world country. And, and these unsophisticated people in other countries, they're actually living in the first world spiritual countries. And in this third world spiritual country in the United States, we should be able to see, just like any other country, it's the same God that we serve. Right? So... But notice it wasn't just a healing. There was what with it? Education. God wants us to have education for our, our neighbors. And uh, that had a huge impact on me. It had a huge impact on the neighborhood. This man where he lives has lots of doctors around him. And you know that God has ways to get his work out. If we try to work for our neighbors in simple ways, we can tell them simple stories, bring them to the Savior, pray with them, touch their hearts. Many will not be healed, but they can have the greater healing of... Uh, of loving the Lord and in process of time some um, the Lord will see fit to miraculously intervene and we need to understand now Dr. Chung is a physician but was it his phys physician's ability that brought cure to this man? No. What we want to encourage people is you can pray for people you can share simple things. There wasn't anything ter terribly sophisticated in what Dr. Chung uh, shared. Is that something that only a doctor could say? No. no. We can do that with our neighbors, and we want to inspire and encourage you. Now, I'd like us to look at a little broader view of even farther uh, visions. Uh, our neighbor is the person that we work with. Our neighbor is the person that we go to school with. 
Our neighbor is the person that we ride on the bus together. Our neighbor is the person who cuts our hair. Um, and I need a neighbor um, right now. Uh, our neighbor is uh, our neighbor is the person who um, checks uh, our groceries at the grocery store, and I want to be a good neighbor to that person. One of the things that my wife has discovered is uh, now I always try to smile and thank them. Um, my wife is. Um, seeking to do something else in an effort to get maybe more uh, acquainted with them in the future. And so she has a little Bible promise bookmark um, in, in color. She's got, she always carries them around. And when she's anywhere she is, whether it's at a, at a uh, gas station or an attendant or whatever, um, she thanks them. And you are so helpful. And she leaves them with a simple promise hoping it can lead to maybe a little more discovery about them, maybe some way to minister to their health needs, maybe some way to just uh, minister to their health needs by a smile. Did you know that you minister to the health needs of others by whether or not you irritate them or whether you bring them peace? God wants us to see the broad aspect of ministering in health. But Dr. Chung has had a uh, some very interesting experiences, not only with his neighbors, not only with his staff, um, but some remarkable experiences that help illustrate how we can be neighbors even when we're traveling. Dr. Chung, you want to share uh, a story or two on uh, neighbors on, on uh, airplanes? Well, I, I, I seem to find a lot of neighbors in airplanes. <laughs> um, and I didn't I, ask you about this airplane. Yeah, I want to. I want to. Um, what I like. What I like to do is I always carry um, a writings of Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy. And as I'm reading, and I kind of tell the next person, "Oh, this is such a good chapter. Would you like to read this?" And uh, they. Look, Almost every one of them read, you know, read that section. Anyway, um, I'd like to tell you three airplane stories. It's all in Delta Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> I was going out to dermatology meeting in San Francisco. And I was um, sitting there next, I was in the middle seat. But before I, I always, before I go, I said, God, please help me to reach somebody. It's a, it's a long flight, you know. And the person to the left of me was on the window seat, no place to go. <laughs> so, and this person was playing this game with other people. And I was just reading... Um, I can't remember exactly what I was reading, but I was reading something. I think it was Desire of Ages. No, no, I'm sorry. It was not Desire of Ages. It was a Patriots and Prophets. And um, as she was playing this game, she got stuck in one of the questions. And I looked at it. It was a medical question. And very simple, you know, for me. <laughs> So I said, it's C. <laughs> so she put C, and he goes, correct. <laughs> he goes, she goes, hey, uh, how, do you, how do you, how do you um, know that? I said, I'm a physician. I'm going to dermatology meeting in San Francisco. He goes, well, my, my husband is a dermatologist. He's also going to a meeting. But they were separate, on separate seats. I said, what is your name? Her name was Danielle. And her husband's name is Daniel. <laughs> and they live in Daniel Island, South Carolina. <laughs> and they say they're building a house. And their contractor's name is Danny. 
And I'm thinking, maybe this is a sign that they should be studying the book of Daniel. <laughs> anyway, um, you know which street they live in, live on? You will never believe this. Never Sorry, it's, it, no, no, it's uh, Buxley Lane. It's, <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm just laughs> anyway, um, and so I asked her, would you like to read a chapter from one of my favorite books, Petros and Prophets? And because she said she had become a Christian. She was a Buddhist before. And she was an, an actress. She said she came on such certain movie and, and HBO and all these things I've never even heard of. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, but I think you're going to enjoy this. And so I turn to the test of faith. Remember, it's about Abraham and Isaac. And she started reading. And she started crying. She said, this is the most wonderful chapter I've ever read in my life. She says, would you like to have this book? And she said, oh. How can I get this book? Can I get it through Amazon? I said, I don't know if you can get through Amazon. But you know, I tell you what, there are five sets of books like this. And if you go through all these five books, and that's what, and I said, I went through these five books, and it really helped me give me, give a lot of insight into the Bible. He said, okay. I said, um, I, I'll let you get you a set. And your husband has said, he goes, oh, okay, thank you so much. You know, my boss is seeking the truth. Would you like, do you mind if you give him a set? <laughs> I mean, no problem. So I sent him the three sets. Now, they want me to come out there to give Bible study. But I just don't know where Daniel Island is, so I need to find time to go out there for a weekend and give the study, basic study on in the book of Daniel. And so it was a small, you know, just a couple of hours, I mean a few hours, and I don't know where this is going to lead, but I know that God was leading. There's another time. I was also sitting on the middle, middle seat, and there was a person on the right of me. Now, now this guy, he can't escape because he can go into the aisle. <laughs> but he was sitting there, and um, I, was, I had a book, Education, by Ellen White. And he thought I was a teacher. And I said, uh, I'm not a teacher, but uh, I'm a physician. And um, I, I was reading the book on, I mean, the chapter on uh, faith and prayer and, he, and and I said would you like to read this chapter this is a great chapter and he's, here he is this man very well dressed and um, he said okay I'd like to I don't mind reading that so he read it started reading and I mean you can read that in 30 minutes that one chapter but it took him over an hour it took him forever to read it and I was wondering, why is it taking so long? But as he was reading, he, he kept making comments about each, each um, paragraph. And so I knew he was reading this. And he said, this is such a good book. And, um, and he was telling me about his story. And he has a billion dollar company. He's a CEO of a company called Epic Passport. Anyway, um, he was he, he he has a success story because he said he only had eighth grade education. He grew up uh, painting painting homes with his father. He came he, he got so good at it that he formed his own company when he was 15 years old. And he had like 60 employees. So he was doing really well. So he never finished high school. And so that's why he was reading so slowly. 
And, he, and I said, do you know, I mean, he was, he was very ashamed about his education. And I said, you don't have to be ashamed. This book it was written by a person with only third grade education. He goes, she, she did? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, would you like to have this book? He goes, yes. So I gave him the book and I go, I'd like to have it for my staff. So how many do you need? Um, 10,000. <laughs> I said, well, I can't give you 10,000, but uh, let, let's just start with 20. <laughs> and he said, I'd like to have you be on my board. <laughs> on your board? I don't know what to do on your board. But, well, you're going to decide on how we spend the money. Well, okay. <laughs> this is a good. <laughs> so, his company is in Chicago, but he lives in California. So he travels a lot. And so he, to he, he told me, I had a um, talk with him just a um, few weeks ago. And so I'm going to go to Chicago to share the truth to all his staff. Amen. Just because I was carrying that book, you know. Never would have, he, he thought I was a teacher because of book education, you know. And he had problem with his education. And a third grader wrote this book. And he said, this is just incredible. See, that's meeting <laughs> temporal needs. Um, you said you had a third one. Well, I, this is a short one. I was in um, um, Weimar with Dr. Mills and and uh, some other people and during lunchtime on Sabbath, I got this strange call. I said, who, who in the world is this? And I got the phone, I answered the phone, I said, hello. He goes, do you remember me? And I said, um, no. He gave me his name. And um, I'm the one that you met, you know, in the, in the plane one year ago. Okay, tell me more, because <laughs> I meet a lot of people in the airplane. <laughs> so you're the one who told me about diet, how I should, you know, he has some skin problems, and I said, I think we can treat it with, with just changing some of your diet, because he had a very poor diet. He calls me a year later, when I was in Weimar, thanking me how that suggestion changed his entire life. He said he lost like, I don't know, 50 pounds and he has no more skin problems and, and um, he lives in Atlanta. He wants me to come out there to talk to all of his friends about this. You know, he says he doesn't have any credibility because he's not a doctor. But if I go and talk to him, then maybe they'll listen, he says. He's not, he doesn't even know about much about the gospel, but he's preaching to all his friends about diet. So health can play a big role, you know, in reaching people with the, with the gospel. Now I have his phone number in my cell phone, and I'm gonna call him very soon and go and talk to all of his friends. And I found out that later on that he is a very famous singer, but I've never heard of this person, so. <laughs> you know, uh, our neighbor is the person who also helps us. And uh, uh, just a very uh, few weeks ago, um, we installed a computer system in our office. And, uh, and so the person who was coming out to train us arrived and he was going to give us a training for uh, one week. And so every day I would have a neighbor for one week that I would never have as a neighbor again. And so uh, I prayed, Lord, help me to be the right kind of neighbor for this important um, opportunity. The first morning he joined with us. He was there at at uh, 8 o'clock at our start, and so I invited him if he wanted to be 
part of our worship. And I prayed, I prayed for him, I prayed for our computer program, I prayed for us to understand it, for him to teach us. And um, I could tell it touched his heart. And so later during the day, I had an opportunity to talk to him about some simple health principles, some dietary principles, because he was having some, some just simple uh, problems with uh, uh, diabetes, uh, which isn't simple, but early, it was very early, and his doctor had told him about the importance of changing his diet, and so I could share what that meant, how to change his diet. And so we walked toward the car. Uh, he stayed an extra hour that day, just sort of hanging around. And when people sort of hang around, you know there's something else they want to say, but they're afraid to say it, but you've got to give them the opportunity. And so he kept hanging around right to the car door. And so I talked a little bit more uh, about health. And, and then, uh, then he said, he said, you're a religious person, aren't you? And I said, yes, I love Jesus. And he says, I've been, he says, have you ever studied anything about the prophecies? He says, right now I'm studying the prophecies, but I don't really understand them. And so I told him, I said, tomorrow night, I said, it's late, I have to, to um, uh, go because I had another uh, appointment. And I also saw that it was probably best to have him wanting more. Uh, so I said, tomorrow night, um, we'll study a prophecy that changed the world. And so um, he was interested in that, so we studied that. Uh, the next night we studied Daniel 2 and um, how it changed Nebuchadnezzar. And, um, uh, so, um, each night we would study a little bit. We had uh, three evenings, and he says, you know, I listen to you, and he makes so much sense, but he says, I'm reading all these other books, and he says, it, it's quite confusing. And that was his last night. So guess what that was asking for? A book. I sent him, I said, let me tell you about a book, and so I tried to make great controversy as attractive as it really is. Told it what it had done for me and for others and what it could do to help him that uh, not just his physical, but God wanted to also help his mental uh, thought and make us whole people. And so he wanted the book. So we shipped it off to him. This week, my uh, Harriet, who's not a, a Christian, but a wonderful uh, person that works in my office, um, she called him for some help. Uh, and he had promised, he, he said, uh, if you need any help in this area, I haven't had a chance to go over it with you, you give me a call. So she gave him a call. And she said, he, he told her, she came out, she said, did you give a book to, uh, to this uh, computer programmer? I said, yes, I did. It's a wonderful book. She says, well, he wanted to let you know when he was talking to me how that book is impacting his life. Amen. And uh, so I want to follow up and uh, get a contact. But that means he then made a sale to Harriet. Guess who's going to get another copy? <laughs> Harriet. Harriet. And the work goes on. If we work with our neighbors, they help work with us. The, the, the watered get, the, the uh, soul that waters gets water in return. God gives us opportunities to help our neighbors, not because we're going to do much of a help to them. He gives us that opportunity because of how much it's going to help us. It's, I sort of picture myself in, in working for others like, my two-year-old son. He's not two now, but he was at one time. <laughs> and he would want to uh, help Daddy. And so he would come and help Daddy. Was he much of a help? No, he was actually in my <laughs> way, except he wasn't in my way because I loved the companionship of my son, right? And he was helping Daddy. 
And so, yes, I, I help God. <laughs> and I'm really in his way, but he likes the companionship. And I like it. I meet God's need for love from his children. And by reaching out to others, they can learn to love him too. And that's our, our, uh, our real desire here. Uh, the Lord has given us many, many neighbors. You have a neighbor right now sitting next to you. God wants you to be a health blessing to them. Um, you have an opportunity in your next meetings, if you're close enough to the speaker, by your interest, by your attention to the speaker, to give them health and help, and they'll preach better. Um, God gives us all kinds of opportunities. I am convicted, as I was studying these things, I was convicted on the importance of unity. And I have been in, in, in a home, and I've been praying, Lord, make me a better husband. Make me a better father. Help me to better understand the needs of my wife. Minister, I want to be helping with health my closest and most wonderful neighbor, the one that's like Jesus, my wife. And, uh, and so we want to, to share these. There are other stories we could share, but there is a very important imperative to sharing with your neighbor. And an experience happened so recently that it still left us shaken, both Dr. Chung and myself. And I hope this helps, this, this story that he's about to tell. I hope this helps you understand the necessity of the person next door. Dr. Chung? Her name, Joan Sane. She came, she's been coming to our Bible study for several years. But for the last, I would say about six to eight months, she stopped coming. But for some reason, she came for the last two weeks. And last Wednesday, she came and... That would be a week ago Wednesday. One week ago yeah. Wednesday. She came and um, she sat right next to me. And, I, and it was... I felt this strong desire to give a strong appeal to make decisions. You know, I said, you've been coming to these Bible studies for years and make a decision. We all have to make decisions, right? We can't just listen and do nothing about that. And she was on the left of me and then after the, after the talk, after the Bible study, she got on her knees and held my hand. And pr we all prayed. She would not let go of my hand. And she finally did. And usually, she, right afterwards, she leaves. But tonight, that night, she stayed. And she wanted to talk to me more. And I could see that she was making a decision. And she went home. Two days later, she died from aneurysm. Just two days. Actually, we don't know if it was two days or the day before, the day after. Because they said she died, either, we have Bible study on Wednesday night, she died either Thursday or Friday because they found her body on uh, early Monday morning. But we never know. We have 
opportunities. God gives us opportunities, right? Yep. And we are the watchmen. Does the Bible say we're the watchmen? Yeah. Whose blood is on us, right? We have been given all these opportunities, all this information. And if we don't use it for God's work, what happened if I didn't, if I said, if she did not want to talk to me or, you know, didn't hold my hand and with prayer and all to, you never know. Now I am confident I will see her again. Absolutely confident. I, I said, Joan, I will see you next week. That's what I said. But I will not see her next week. Right? You know, we spent, you know, several years ago, there was a, a, a young girl stuck in a, like a, a well. Do you remember that? And it was on TV, it's in Texas somewhere. And all this, I mean, there, it was a huge deal. And they were trying to drill another, another, another yeah, shaft and try to, and you know, when they finally got her out, I mean, it was on TV everywhere and they spent all this energy and time rescuing this one girl, right? I mean, that's just for temporal life. We have the chance to give everyone eternal life. If they can spend all that energy to give temporal life to a, one person, how much more energy should we spend to give life, eternal life to other people? So our appeal to all of you today is every single person that we meet at home, next door neighbor, the airplane, patients, clients, is your neighbor. And you are responsible. Think of it as, you know, when I study something, I say, this is what I study. I said, I'm gonna study this, and this is the last time I'm gonna be reading this. So, you know, I focus really hard <laughs> because I said, I'm not going to ever see this again. You know what I mean? Even though I can, but that's my mentality. And so I spend, you know, I really focus in trying to remember. Now, if you have that attitude to your neighbor, say, this is the last time I will ever see this person. What would I say to this person if I know this person is going to die? Mr. Beavers, I thought he was going to die. He said, that's why I was willing to stay 8 o'clock and I came home at 5. I said, you know, a few hours of sleep, I'd rather have this person have assurance of salvation. And not only him, but his whole family. And so, all of us, we are neighbors to every single one. Uh, he's my neighbor. Dr. Mills has impacted my life tremendously. And, you know, the person next to you, we're all neighbors. It says, I, I like to just read this one more time. The Good Samaritan, then we can end with this. Thus the question, who is my neighbor, is forever answered. For how long? Forever. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the, one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to color or race or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. 
our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Let's pray. Do you want to be that kind of neighbor like Jesus was for us, reaching down to help us temporally? Right now, he's concerned about your health. He's giving you breath, and he's giving me a heartbeat. And he wants me to be the neighbor to others that he is to us. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit help us. Make us the neighbor you've called us to be in our offices, in our homes, in our churches. May we seek to minister to the needs of those around us. Open our eyes to see the hearts that cry. Give us sensitivity to the hurts and the pains. Keep our eyes on Jesus and on the others to which he directs. I pray for this ASI convention. I pray that your spirit may fall this Sabbath evening in this next, the uh, next day tomorrow, the Sabbath. And we just commit our lives to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.